the all somebody to I'd like to thank this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank a guy named Jay. Um, we will be changing our internet service tomorrow, and uh, but Jay works for the company we'll be changing from, and um, he helped us the last day here get back on the. Uh, I mean, we were still supposed to be on the current internet, and. The fact this morning he was so courteous, even though we're changing tomorrow, to help us with the issue today. I just like to praise God. And then I found out toward the end of the conversation, he started telling me about his church he went to in Kansas City, Kansas. So uh, I just bless Jay today and thank God. So if you're watching on Facebook today, uh, know that at first we didn't think we were going to get to live stream today, but uh, we had someone come through. The Lord had a servant out there that even though he was having to work on a Sunday, he was serving the Lord, you know, so we praise God for that this morning. This morning, we want to talk about living the victorious Christian life. It, you know, it'd be nice if I could tell you to live in the victorious life. You'd never have a challenge in your life or never have a, uh, something uh, come up that was uh, not always easy. But, you know, I've always said this, whether you agree with it or not, you know, a lot of times great victories are on the other side of great battles. And that doesn't mean we always have a a super big battle every day, but I'd like to just this morning, let's look at the life of Elijah this morning, and I'd like to pray before we start. Father, we thank you that Elijah was a man of God, and Lord, your word tells us he was a man just like us, just like a human just like us, that Christians, men and women, we can identify with him, Father, and that God, uh, you talk about the prayer, the effective prayer prayer of the righteous availing much so father i pray today that what we glean out of elijah's life that you will use it to help us individually walk as in victory help this church to walk in victory and wherever you and however you call us to serve in the kingdom of god it work play retirement wherever god uh, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we walk in victory, God, no matter. All that are here, Lord, will walk in victory, God, because you're a victorious God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, one thing Elijah's just done, he's just proclaimed a drought. Now, that probably didn't make him the most popular man around, okay? They probably, probably wasn't uh, they were, uh, good for church growth there when he did that. But uh, he proclaims a drought. Well, a drought with a drought, you know what comes with a drought? Famine comes with a drought, you know, uh, because these people got to grow food. Uh, they got to grow food to eat themselves. They got to grow food for the animals. And so uh, food is scarce during this time. And so as I said earlier, living a victorious life doesn't mean that we won't face adversity. I thank God that the fact I can look at some of you being here today has told me that you are living the victorious life because I know some of the adversity that several of you, you have faced as you've gone through challenges in life here. You know, as Sister uh, Patricia gave her testimony there, and Sister Vicki, they're living a victorious life, yet they've been through some adversity recently, you know, and we go through adversity. So uh, what living a victorious life does, though, it does give us an opportunity to glorify God even when we go through adversity. It's an opportunity in some way that we can glorify God. Now, I'm not one of these people that's going to tell you God sends you something to make you miserable. I don't believe that, okay? But I believe when, the, uh, when life deals you stuff or when the enemy deals you stuff, God is going to be with you in that time. So the first thing that we want to do, if you look in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, 17, verse 2 through 6. I'm going to read from there. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse through 2 through 6. Uh, this is just after he's declared the drought. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it from my text then. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Shereth, which flows into the Jordan and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, 
For he went and stayed by the brook Sherith, which flows into the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, the first thing, if you want to make a note in your Bible uh, about this, is to live the victorious life. You've got to be able to hear the voice of God. You've got to be able to hear the voice of God. You hear the voice of God when you read the Word of God. You hear the voice of God sometimes when God uses one of his servants to prophesy you and the prophecies lining up with the word of God. You hear the voice of God uh, when you hear the message preached. I pray you do. Uh, you, pray, you hear the voice of God. Sometimes God speaks through things. I, I was in Hamilton one day not too long ago. And, and right in front of me, uh, there was a car, and it, had, uh, it, it was the Serb Pro car. And right on the back of it, it had uh, just as it had never happened on the back of those Serb Pro cars. And I, I knew that that was telling me something of some time when I was supposed to give a talk somewhere about what that meant. Well, right in front of that car was a truck that had John Love, John 316, on the back of it. Now, I don't think that's no co coincidence. Why am I telling you that? God will speak to you through things out here in, in nature. I'm not saying God is nature. No, he, he created nature. But God will speak to you. He'll speak to you if you and I will listen. And he, but he speaks to us through that small, still voice of the Holy Spirit. You, he walks with me, and he talks with me. Listen, the person who wrote that song had an encounter with God. They weren't just making up rhymes to try to get a song sold. Amen? So you want to hear the voice of God, and then you want to obey the voice of God. Now, sometimes <laughs> when we hear and obey the voice of God, it might not make sense in the natural. If I told some of you today, why don't you leave here today, rather go in your favorite restaurant or going home where you prepared a good meal, and go out here and see what the crows has drug up, what would you think if I told you? <laughs> you'd think they need to check me out, wouldn't you? Well, you think about Elijah. Ravens are just, glor that's just a glorified name for crows, okay? <laughs> and you know what? They eat the stuff that the other animals has already been eating the dead stuff and left for them. But you know what? God can sanctify what a raven brings up. God can supernaturally make something good out of what something in the natural stinks. God can make something good in the supernatural out of something that might be even distasteful. You know, I'm just in my imagination. I wondered if he put them ravens in little nice butler's outfits or something. You know, I don't know. I don't think yes, he did. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But you know what? God, I guarantee you God dressed it up. Because Elijah was obedient to God. Elijah heard the voice of God. So one thing you want to do if you're going to walk in victory, you got to live, to, or to live the victorious life. You want to be able to hear the voice of God. You want to be able to obey the voice of God. That's why it's important we spend time in the Word because the devil will try to come and imitate the voice of God sometimes. But the Word of God says, His sheep know my voice, and I call them by name, and they won't follow another. Amen. The next thing you want to do, if you look in verse 8 through 16, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, I'd be thinking, oh, I bet she had a lot of money. You know, I bet her husband was well healed, <laughs> or her deceased husband. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. Now, in a drought, you get thirsty. Amen. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. In a famine, you get hungry. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son 
that we may eat it and die. You know, that spirit of death was there. You know, you and I, thank you, Lord. I didn't have that down, but, you know, you know where that spirit of death is, God is calling you to I to bring life into the situation. We're, we, we are carrying the life of Christ in us. So she's ready to give up. She's ready to let her son go on. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Isn't that a good word for a man of God? You know, Elijah was a prophet of God. There may be some of you that you operate in that gift, uh, you know, office gift of a prophet or a prophetess. Or there may be some here that one day you will operate in that gift. But I can tell you what, God desires all his children to prophesy. God desires all his children to speak life where there is is death and I must admit I've had to repent there's been some places where there's been death this week and my response I've just spoke death back you know what I mean because there's a lot of death in the culture this day and time but you and I we got a choice we can speak life or we can speak death that doesn't mean we compromise what we believe but Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are truth. It is the spirit that gives life. I think I rearranged that verse, but you get the picture. So Elijah is bringing life into the situation. He says, do not fear. Go and do as you've said, but make me a small cake from it first. And bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. Isn't it good to know if we can walk so close to the Lord that we can say, Thus saith the Lord. That's how close he was walking with the Lord. You see, when you walk in victory, you got to go where God says to go. That didn't make sense to go to a widow unless she had been a well-heeled widow that her husband had been a big <laughs> millionaire or something. But he's going to a widow that's ready to die. But he had to be thinking, you know, this is, I heard the voice of God. This is where God said to go. This is what God said to do. So you may want to make note, I skipped that high point there. To walk in victory, you have to go where God says to go. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you've said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to myself, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up. Notice he's prophesying life. He's prophesying life. You know, the Word says when we prophesy, we bring edification, exhortation, and comfort unto men. <laughs> He's saying, you're not going to run out, honey. <laughs> For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. He's prophesying that the famine, the drought's not going to last forever. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. For many days. You know, isn't it good that God can do a lot with a little? <laughs> Jesus demonstrated that, didn't he? <laughs> they always had more than they needed. <laughs> they always had. He'd tell the disciples, pick up the fragments. <laughs> You know, God wants that mentality in us. So if you walk in victory, you got to go where God says to go. Walking in victory means you're expecting God to come through in your situation. He might, hey, he's come through in some situations in our lives. It, he, it wasn't exactly like I thought he was going to come through. And I'm not making an excuse for God. God don't have to have anybody make excuses for him. 
I might just say uh, we know in part and we prophesy in part, and I might have knew in part, <laughs> but he always comes through. He don't lose. It also means believing and knowing that God will supply more than enough. I think I hit on that already. But believing he's going to supply more than enough. I'd like to tell you you wouldn't be challenged with that, you know. I'm sure it was a challenge in Elijah, as I've said earlier, when he goes up to this widow's house. <laughs> That would have been a good one, except it was several hundred years later. You'd be expecting it would have been the rich young ruler's grandma or somebody. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but God comes through. The next thing, if you want to make note of this, to walk in victory, you got to take risk and expect the impossible. If you're going to walk in victory, you got to take risk and expect the impossible. You're going to walk in victory. There'll be times you just you got to take a risk. The Christian faith, the journey with the Jesus is a risk-taking journey. Those disciples had to risk. He, he had told them he would be back on the third day. But they're looking at Romans it, with swords and spears and religious people. It didn't like them. <laughs> they had to take risk. They ran away, but they came back and took the risk. They had to take risk after they'd been filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It'd been nice if they could have camped out in that upper room and said, Hey, y'all come up here. We have some powerful services here. The fire falls here. <laughs> but he told them the fire was falling so they could take it out. <laughs> Because he wanted the fire to fall in Asia. He wanted to fall in Galatia, in Ephesus. He wanted to fall in Pamphylia. He wanted to fall in the United States. He still wanted it to fall. In verse 17 through 24, now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. Here comes the spirit of infirmity. <laughs> and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. They didn't have a 911. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? She thought that Elijah was bringing death in the house. Some of you might be here today thinking God wants to bring something bad upon you, but God wants to bring something good to you. Some of us, you know, Donnie mentioned uh, this morning all the chains that the Lord had freed him from this morning. And, and I, buddy, I about every one of them used name and went right in there with me, Donnie. But I, I can remember before that thinking, man, if, if, if I give up all that stuff them chains was doing, you know, if I gave up having hangovers every morning, I might not have a good time being a Christian. <laughs> or, or if I gave up, uh, you know, my nose bleeding every morning from doing the cocaine all night, I might not have a good time being a Christian. <laughs> now, see, the devil can really have your head turned in the wrong direction. I could lift some other stuff, but I won't do it because we... <laughs> But you get the picture. But to walk in victory, you got to take risk. And there may be time that God calls you to leave a place that's safe for you. Because he wants you to take a risk. He had to take a risk. In verse 17 through 24, it says, Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I do? I know I'm repeating that, but somebody needs to hear it. O oh, man of God, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Listen, God's not wanting to kill us. God's wanting to give life to us. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh, Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow 
with whom I lodge by killing her son, even when you're walking close to God, even when you're operating in the prophetic, there may be some times you're wondering, God, where are you? <laughs> Has anybody ever said, God, where are you? Anybody besides me? All right, the rest of you be forgiven. I know you knew deep down inside God was with you, and we did too. And Elijah knew it too. But sometimes in the natural, we begin to question things. And then he takes a risk. <laughs> He lays his ministry on the line right there. <laughs> In verse 21, he stretched himself out on the child three times, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God. Now, he's doing some praying. He ain't making a declaration right here unless I'm reading that wrong. Let this child. He says, and we believe in making declarations. There's time God says to declare it. And then there's sometimes God says, ask it. That's why you want to be walking with the Holy Spirit. He don't always do it the same way every time. He said, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul, hallelujah, of the child came back to him, and he revived. Amen. You know, God wants the soul of the church of Jesus Christ to come back to it and be revived. God wants a nation, the soul of a nation to come back and be revived. God wants the soul of a preacher to come back and be revived, you know. He's in the reviving business. But Elijah took a risk. It's a risk-taking journey. And then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Isn't it good when you know he's heard your voice? Did you know he's heard your voice every time you've prayed? He's heard your voice every time you've prayed. And don't let the enemy convince you he hasn't. And he knows the end from the beginning. And there'll be things we get to heaven and, wow. I'm not going to say you're going to wait to heaven to know it all. I mean, to know some things. We'll, we'll still be learning a million years. When we've been there 10,000 years, we'll still be learning. But he took a risk. He laid on that child. And then the woman, he takes the child down. I'm in verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know you're a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. You know, God still does the miraculous today. <laughs> and God, there's people, God is going to, there's people that are going to know you're a woman of God or a man of God by what God does through you in your life. Did you hear what I said? And it's going to be miraculous things. And don't think that a soul getting saved is not miraculous. It's the greatest miracles there's ever been. And that's not making the others not wanting to see them done. Get honest with God. You know, it's good we can be honest with God. <laughs> a few times I've tried to hide a few things. Let me know him better. <laughs> you ever done that? <laughs> Knowing he knows that all. You, when he stretched himself out on that woman's child, he does a prophetic act. Some of you, you I've seen you do prophetic acts. And God's had you do prophetic acts, things that, Maybe it didn't make sense. <laughs> Why did God tell me to walk around a building seven times? You know, there's not a, ma a magic formula, but sometime God told you to walk around a building seven times. And it looked stupid to the world. Maybe God had you go up and pray for somebody in the store, and you took the risk. They're going to think I'm crazy. Yesterday I was down at the... Las Amigas, and I was sitting there eating. We just got through the leopard, and 
I was hungry and thirsty, doing my best to take care of both of them. And there was two men came in. One of them was, they both, I, I thought they were both Hispanic. And one of them I felt for sure was. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you need to go ask them if they're pastors. And so I, 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 you know. So the waitress comes over and I said, hey, do you know if them men are pastors over there? I just want her to eat. She said, no, I don't know. I said, well, how about some of the staff around here? You know, you think they know? You know? No, I don't think none of them knows, you know. I said, you, know, you know, like that. So I just kept eating my quesadilla there, you know, and, <laughs> and everything. And finally, uh, after I got through, I said, okay. I can't say I did. I was 100% obedient because the Lord might have wanted me to buy their lunch. I didn't. But I did go up, and I say, are you two guys pastors? And one guy said, well, I'm not. I'm from Memphis. I said, but he is. And said, he's from, uh, I said, is he from Mexico or Guatemala? He said, Guatemala. And so I began to tell him, and because I, you know, I said, well, you know, I've been to Guatemala, and I believe I'm called to go to Guatemala. I said, but I, I don't know if I really know a, past, a Hispanic pastor in Hamilton. And it seems like if I'd know some in Guatemala, I'd know some here. <laughs> not that that mean I'm not supposed to go to Guatemala. I am. But it also uh, doesn't, you know. And so uh, he, he just asked me if I knew anybody that might could teach him English. I volunteered Eddie, by the way, Cheryl. Uh, and so uh, so uh, anyway, sometimes you got to take a risk. Sometimes God's going to nudge you to pray for somebody. Somebody's going to, sometimes going to not ask, nudge you to ask somebody if they know the Lord. Sometimes God's going to nudge you to buy that lunch. Sometimes God's going to nudge you to take a risk in some way. And you know, you're not going to know unless you take the risk. But to walk in victory, it means taking risks sometimes. And we have to be willing to to take a risk. Did you notice Elijah pleaded with God? I'm glad we can plead with God. Yeah, I thank God we can make declarations. I thank God we pray the word, we speak the word. But then I thank God that we can plead with him too. Oh, please, God. Please, God. Please save my son. God, please save my daughter. God, please save our grandchildren. God, please bring revival in a land. God, <laughs> where our children will experience the freedom of being able to gather and worship, where our grandchildren will experience the freedom of being able to gather and worship. I was thankful yesterday we could have, for what God did out there at the upward yesterday, we had the freedom in this community to do that. And I can't tell you how many different congregations were represented in some way because it's about the kingdom. It was Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals. People that believe in helping, serving in some way. I didn't mean to leave anybody out. If I did, I don't know if all of them would want me to call their name out or not. Okay. Amen. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful for this church, thankful for the body of Christ, thankful for risk takers. Now, he walks down with that widow's son in her hands, in his hands. He shows her what God's done. You heard this man testify this morning. You heard others testify. You heard Patricia testify. You heard Sister Carolyn testify. You heard Vicky get up here. You know, I've heard others of it. But you've got to be willing sometime to tell somebody what God's done for you. Because the miracle he's done for you, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Because if you read further, there's going to be a guy named Elisha that will succeed him that Elijah had to tell him sometime <laughs> uh, about raising this widow's son because he's going to run into a Shumanite widow sometime. And God's going to call him to get in the miracle business there too. 
So if there's some way God's worked miraculous in your life, you know, I, you know, I've, I've heard it before, you know, preach the gospel, use words that's necessary. That's good, that's good, but that doesn't mean you don't preach the gospel and tell people about it. Because the gospel is about proclaiming what God has done for you because God wants others to know he's still in that business. Hey, when I was living in sin, I'm glad for them old boys that had a Pentecostal mother when I was in the dressing room at Dora High School and they was talking about their mama taking oil on it and putting it on their head when they got sick. You know, I might have been scoffing at them or making fun of them a little bit. I didn't do it out loud because they could have both took me uh, down. You know what I mean? But, you know, down inside. But can I tell you one thing? When I got saved and I got to know Jesus, I remembered what them boys testified about in the dressing room down there and then I remember seeing a man one time when he got oil put on him and prayed for he had to leave a meeting before that but he came back in the meeting healed so sometimes you got to tell somebody and show somebody what God has done for you amen if he's brought you off drugs, hallelujah. Listen, there's a generation, a culture. I want to tell you, up here Friday, I went in there with a group. It was working, uh, the Kairos, and Sister Tanya had them all in there, about 20 of them, nine of the girls from Lifehouse. And I heard a girl testify that she started drinking when she was 12 years old and got into drugs when she was 15. I don't, like I told her, I said, you know, we didn't start that stuff too much later in my day. Uh, but right now, somebody needs to know. Somebody needs to know there's a deliverer. Somebody know, needs to know there's a healer. Somebody needs to know there's a restorer. Somebody needs to know that there's somebody that can raise up the age-old waste places, that there's somebody that can repair broken streets and dwellings, that there's somebody that can make all things new. There's somebody that can give life where death was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God. To walk in victory, if you want to make a note of this one. See, if you make a note, you won't make your preacher feel bad when you watch television. You see all them people making notes of what their preacher says and everything. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. All right. All right. He says, if you're going to walk in victory, though, you can't stay down after a setback. Can I admit there's been setbacks I've had that I won't stay down? And I know some of you have experienced some. Because you know what? It sucks so much out of you. It sucks so much out of you. You want to stay down. When somebody real close to you. Leaves this walk of life. It sucks something out of you. Yeah, we, we joy that they're with the Lord, but it sucks something out of us. When we go through any kind of disappointment, it sucks something out of us. And you know something? A lot of times, the setback might come after a big victory. Look at Elijah. He walked in victory. I'm going to paraphrase this part, of it, but you can go read the whole story in case I leave something out, okay, because it's a lot. But you know, he went up to Mount Carmel, and there the Baal prophets were. <laughs> and there's a confrontation there. We're going to show these people who's really God. And you remember the Baal prophets? They danced around and did all this, cut their self and all this stuff, and Elijah was there mocking them. <laughs> that wasn't real. <laughs> Could you imagine mocking somebody that was in another religion? They would write you up in the press today <laughs> if you was out there. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not saying that's something you ought to do. <laughs> but in this case, that's what God told him to do, okay? <laughs> and 
And when Baal can't send a fire, oh, 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 he knows to call on the one that can send a fire. He has them rebuild the altar with the 12 stones marking each one of the tribes of Israel. He has them take water and pour it around the ditch three times again, one time for the Father, one time for the Son, and one time for the Holy Ghost. And God sends the fire on the altar. I like that song Sister Karen Wheaton used to sing, Wet Wood on the Altar. <laughs> Or send the fire. I, you know, bring the fire. Wet wood on the altar. Them t those tears that you were shedding up here this morning, there's fire coming in the situation or circumstance. Because wet wood on the altar. So he has a great victory. He has a great victory. Can you imagine having a victory like that? You've just seen God in the drought because he sends his servant out there, and he says, a cloud the size of a man's hand. Man, if it was me, I'd be jumping and dancing and praising the Lord, and I'm sure he was. He was celebrating and having a good time, and then here comes the counterattack. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Have you ever been serving God and you've been somewhere? Uh, maybe you've worked a retreat somewhere, or you've been in a powerful service somewhere, or God has used you to uh, go do something good for somebody. You just knew you were used for God, and you felt so good about it. And here came the enemy, tried to beat you down, tried to make you feel bad. You know, what was you doing up there leading that prayer meeting all night? You ought to have been somewhere else. <laughs> what were you doing over there? Anything. He got a lot. That spirit got Elijah to the place that Elijah wanted to take his own life. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are serving the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you that spirit will come. And we need to be able to raise, be praying to our brothers and sisters in the Lord that we can raise up a standard, that a standard be raised up against it. So Elijah's down. He's down. He's down, folks. He's down. But you know, the Bible says the righteous may fall seven times, <laughs> but they'll rise again. Turn to 1 Kings 19, verse 11. I'm getting close. Then he said... He thinks he's all alone. He thinks he's all alone. You ever thought you was all alone in this? You know, that's a tool of the enemy to make you think you're all alone. That's why God's got the body of Christ where they have each other too. But then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And you know, sometimes the Lord's in the wind. Amen. The wind came in on the day of Pentecost. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. And we know God's in the fire sometimes too. Amen. He was in the fire when Moses met him. He was in the fire when Elijah saw him out there when he broke the altars down. He'd be, he would be in the fire on the day of Pentecost. And after the fire, though, came that still, small voice. Aren't you thankful for that still, small voice? How many times has that still, small voice comforted you? How many times has that still, small voice comforted you? When you felt like you were alone, you felt like you were abandoned, you felt like there was no, and that still, that still small voice said, I'm with you, my child. Or maybe you were seeking direction in your life, and you heard that small, still voice say, this is the way, go in it. 
Are you heard that uh, smile, still voice say, fear not. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. I'll be with you when you go in the waters. The rivers won't sweep over you. I'll be with you when you walk through the fire. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I make streams in the desert. The owls and jackals fear my name. Oh, hallelujah, this morning. Keep going, Cheryl. Please. Okay. All right. And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Mm. Keep going. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. You see, he had somebody to even come behind Elijah to finish the job that God had started. He had somebody to come finish the job because what God starts, God will finish so that God gets the glory for it. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, Cheryl. I think I got one more verse. Amen. He said, yet, hallelujah, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Look around you this morning. You got people that are praying for you this morning in this house. We got people praying for each other. You got brothers and sisters in Christ in other houses uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ that are praying for you. God's not left you alone, my friends. And that last point, to walk in victory, you got to know that God will finish the job. If you know how the job got finished, I'll paraphrase it, and if I miss it, you can correct me during the week, okay? But he'll raise up Elisha. He'll raise up Jehu. And Jehu, they will take Jezebel out. <laughs> Ahab will be gone. And they'll walk in the victory. God, how much more can we, as New Testament children of God, walk in the victory that have been born of the Spirit, washed in His blood, cleansed by His in the fountain, walk in victory. Because that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is exerted in us, His children. We can walk in victory. I've seen you, a lot of you walk in victory. When disappointment and heartbreaks come, And you know what? You're an inspiration to others. Because God will redeem it all. He will redeem it all. Yesterday we started to upward and we, and we had to kind of a little crisis come up. I thought we had all of our referees lined up and Felt like when we started, the Lord told me to ask some pastors that had not participated in this before to just come do the devotionals at halftime, and then ask some youth leaders, and then maybe some of our other, you know, the people to do. So I'd asked uh, pa the Pastor Soils from the Baptist Church to do the devotionals, and and so Thursday night uh, I just sent him a message to remind him, uh, you know, what time we played and everything, and. And I remember he, he sent me a text back. He said, I'll bring my referee shirt and my whistle. And I just responded, yeah, great. I said, great, that'll be good because, you know. I, but yesterday morning, hardly any of our referees could come, and I thought about how, how the Lord was taking care of that. And he did such a good job refereeing and with the devotionals. And I thought about, you know, my first instinct yesterday morning was to get up and be concerned that some of the referees weren't going to be there. Some of them just had some tough things happen to them. You know, they were legitimate things. 
But you know, if we'll walk in victory, when hardship comes, he'll provide what he needs. He'll provide everything. And we had a great and glorious day. Walk in victory. Knowing Jesus has promised he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's with us always. In it, he ain't. I'm going to ask if, if the elders would come up this morning with their, uh, this morning and I'm going to ask this morning if Ben and Sherry would come up. I know we've had altered time this morning, but maybe this morning there's something inhibiting you from walking in victory, and you want somebody to pray. All these prophesy. If, you know, if you've never had anybody prophesy over you, you know, it's biblical. The Word says, you know, that we are to prophesy. And I don't know the, what the Lord would, have, would say through these this morning. Maybe you've never been saved. Can I, can I tell you something? I never had been at one time either. And I would say my record as an unsaved person was pretty, you know, <laughs> I thank God for him saving me and giving me new life. Whatever this morning, the altar is open at this time. Brother Donnie, would y'all come back this morning and pray this morning, please, you and Sister Vicki. Lord, I pray right now for all our servants that will minister in the altar this morning. I thank you for the gifts that you've given each of these, Father. And, Father, I pray this morning that you will use these to help us walk in victory. Lord, I do pray this morning, if there's somebody this morning that they feel like their life has been one of total defeat, one that there's no victory in, that the Spirit of the living God would draw these to that place, Lord. If they've never been to the cross, to the cross of Jesus Christ where all things become new. And Lord, if there are those of us that have been to the cross, but God, we're down at that place maybe where Elijah was. Maybe we're down there saying, I'm all alone. I feel like I'm in this by myself. That they need to hear from God this morning, Father. I pray you would stir up these prophetic and intercessory gifts in your servants, God. And none would go out of here today, God, not walking in victory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Y'all point your hands toward Eric. His stepdad is taking a driving test this morning for a commercial job. And also, he's got some breathing issues. So, y'all just be in agreement.
Amen. 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 I praise God's, God's doing something in his life. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric. 